What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the very end of what has been an amazing 2023 NFL draft season. We are here with my final draft grades, where we're going to go through division by division, team by team, pick by pick, talking about every single draft pick, grading every individual draft. I do want to say before we get started, we always get comments saying, draft grades are stupid. You're not an NFL GM. I trust my team's GM more. We don't know anything about these players until three years after they get drafted. Why are you watching then? Like, cool. You want to take that approach? That's fine. You want to have blind faith in your team's NFL GM? That's totally fine. I get it. But as a draft analyst, I have spent hundreds and hundreds of hours watching these players. I'm here to offer up my honest opinions on who got great value, who potentially took worse players ahead of better players, where I might have gone, and ultimately who had great drafts and is setting their team up for success into the future. It's a fun exercise. These are my honest opinions. Of course, I could be wrong, just like your team's GM could be wrong. It happens every year, and in fact, a lot of times my D and F graded picks turn out to be pretty damn stupid picks, and we knew it in real time. So I'm going to try and tell you who some of those picks might have been over the weekend. But ultimately, I also am just here to talk about who these players are, how they fit with each team, and how I think they could project into the next few years. I have changed up my grading scale a little bit in a way that I think you guys are really going to appreciate. Uh, now, the, there's a much bigger emphasis on the first three rounds really being where the meat and potatoes of a draft are. That's where you're going to see those A, B, C, D, F grades. Whereas into day three, it's much more adding context to how I feel about the pick. I'll try to explain that a little bit as we go. You can also check out the criteria now in the description below. I think it's going to add a little bit of transparency and true consistency to these grades that I think a lot of you are going to really appreciate, and it's going to improve this exercise into the future. So uh, let's get into it. I do ask, please, just take a second to hit that like button down below. I really do appreciate it. It's a free and easy way to support my channel. And make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of the other eight divisional draft grades uh, or seven other divisional draft grades videos we've got coming. We've got my deep dive series just around the corner, previewing in depth every single NFL team season. And I think that's the best I have to offer on this channel. So you're not going to want to miss that. You're not going to want to miss all my NFL content. You can join me on this quest for 100,000 subscribers this year. Would love to hit that goal. So hit that subscribe down below and let's get into it. And let's kick things off with the Dallas Cowboys who came out the gate and really made one of my favorite picks in the entire first round, taking Mazzy Smith. And maybe I'm just biased because I've personally been making this very selection for the Dallas Cowboys, pounding the table for Mazzy Smith at 26 for Dallas for months, and they did it. In fact, when I was on Clickbait Sports as a guest appearance, Scooter Magruder asked me, who is that missing piece for the Dallas Cowboys? And without hesitation, I looked him square in the eyes through the camera and said, Mazzy Smith. So there you go. Like that speaks for itself how much I love this fit. Dallas, to me, has really been missing that mauler in the trenches on the defensive side of the ball. They've got all these great athletes. They have one of the best pass rushes in the NFL, but they have had games where they really struggle in run defense, and Mazzy Smith really stacks up with the best defensive tackle prospects in recent classes as far as straight raw block shedding grade. You want to talk about how you can get off blocks as a run defender, get off, arm length, strong arm length, accurate hands, size to anchor and not get moved around. But it's not just strength and arm length and hand placement. An underrated aspect of block shedding is agility and ability to use quick feet to slip blocks. And Mazzy Smith has this rare combination at about six, two and a half, 330 pounds with great arm length, but really rapid quick feet as well that occasionally show up uh, from him as a pass rusher. And he was reportedly supposed to run this wicked three cone as well. He ultimately, I think, was dealing with an injury and didn't do that. But either way, it shows up on tape. I love this pick. To me, Dallas filled so many needs in free agency, and they really Honestly, when you look at the value and the fit and the stakes of this pick for a team that is trying to win a Super Bowl right now, 
This was such a fantastic pick. Now, you get to day two, and I was honestly very underwhelmed by Dallas's picks. And again, I could very easily be wrong here, but based on my evaluations of these players, I think they were pretty major reaches. I look at Luke Schoenmacher at the end of the second round, and to me, you didn't just reach a couple rounds on this player, in my opinion, but you passed up on better players. Tucker Kraft and Darnell Washington, I know he had some health concerns, but I'd rather gamble on that than take Schoenmacher in the you know second round. He's a good athlete. He sh runs good routes. I'm not saying he's a certified bust, but I just don't think the risk is worth the reward here. He's going to turn 25 in his rookie season. He's a little bit lighter. He's not a great run blocker. To me, I had a better, I had a higher grade on Jake Ferguson last year. I compared Jake Ferguson to Dalton Schultz, and Jake Fer Ferguson came out and played exactly up to that report. And I just don't think you needed the tight end here. Um, I think it's a reach and. You know, he he could prove me wrong. He could turn into a solid starter. There's there's things about him that remind me of maybe some guys like Dawson Knox or Foster Moreau. But even then, it's like Foster Moreau in the second round. Are you making that pick? No. Um, you know, Dawson Knox just got replaced after getting a big contract. That's been fine. Uh, to me, I would be surprised if Schumacher is a starter here in the second round really now or ever. So uh, I could very well be wrong, but I disagreed with that pick. And then uh, also Damari and Overshone at the end of the third round, I'm just straight up. Like, I think this was reaching on a hometown kid when there were, um, when it's a reach and there were better players available. The very next pick, Dorian Williams comes off the board and I just cannot get behind that evaluation. Dorian Williams is faster. He's thicker. He understands the position better. He actually plays the run. He actually looks around in coverage and has zone IQ and had ball production that Damarian Overshone didn't. I did have Damarian Overshone as a draftable prospect as a fifth, sixth round draft stash and develop linebacker and see what you can get. And I honestly would like this pick better if they see him as a J-Run curse replacement in that role, which to me, I think could be a good spot for him, to be honest. And, and maybe he uh, can carve out a good role there, but... I mean, man, I just didn't see it with Damarian Overshone. I, I understand I'm I'm against the grain a little bit there. A, a lot, most people had Overshone as a top 10 linebacker. I didn't. He ended up as my LB 16. Um, even if it's not Dorian Williams, I think Servasia Dennis is going to be a better player. I think D. Winters out of TCU, if you wanted to stay home in Texas, is a better athlete that had better high-end tape. Uh, so I'm going to be betting against a Marion Overshone. We'll, we'll look back on this in a couple years and, and see how it played out. You know, this is, this is a player that I'm not going to be able to take any victory laps on for two or three years if I'm right, because linebacker is such a developmental position. I just think they way overspent on this player and passed on better prospects for what they were looking for. So uh, that's, that's just my honest opinion there. Uh, but you get to day three, and, and I really like what they did down the board, especially with that fourth round pick. I can't sing the praises of this fit any more than I'm about to do with Viliami Fahoko to Dallas in the, at the end of the fourth round. I also had a fourth round grade on Fahoko, and there's so many parallels to players that make sense in this system and, and for this team. A lot of Cowboys fans are going to remember Tyron Crawford as that kind of hybrid defensive end type. You look at Dan Quinn, who's had, going back all the way to Seattle, a guy like Michael Bennett. I, I don't think Fahoko's Michael Bennett, but Michael Bennett was a very late round draft pick. But either way, you know, Fahoko to me is the perfect missing piece for that defensive line. Not that they needed a starter, but as a rotational, almost like sixth man of the year type for that defensive line. If you need a five technique that can help defend the run that already got better, you know, your, your run defense already got better getting Mazzy. But if you want to maybe play Micah Parsons as a linebacker, as they like to do, or you think uh, Armstrong, um, um, uh, uh, Lawrence needs a breather, right? You can put Fahoko out there as a five technique, and he is a 275-pound uh, five tech with really good run defense on tape, good strength, good foot speed, good kind of, um, you know, set the edge ability from that five tech. But beyond that, he can rush 
the passer on play action. He's a really good kind of slow burn pass rusher. He's not a great athlete. It's why he's probably never going to be a starter here or a full-time starter. Um, but what he does is just deconstruct blocks on his way to the quarterback. This is a guy that had over 100 pressure, uh, 100 pressure, over 100 pressures and 20 sacks over the last two years. He has a rare instinctive ability and a unique pass rushing style where, you know, he's not driving guys back with early wins on bull rushes or flying around the edge or winning with quick hitting, you know, inside counters. No, he's he's kind of deconstructing blocks with that slow burn approach, ripping through blocks, setting guys up, navigating his way through the traffic to the quarterback and when you go against play action that is actually a more effective style of pass rushing than it is going to be for those quick winning type of guys so that's why he's like the perfect early down five tech but i think he can win on the inside as a three tech as, as a four eye as well if mazzy needs a breather and you want to go with that kind of nascar package with osa odigazua and now Fahoko as your interior rushers. I love that as well. The flexibility here, you know, he's going to play 200 snaps or so. He's going to defend the run well. I think he's going to end up with 15, 20 pressures, three or four sacks. That's a great player at the end of the fourth round. So I'm a big fan of that fit. One of my better just like uh, fits for teams, um, even if he's never a superstar. But that's exactly what you're looking for here on day three with a lot of these picks, right? Um, but different process with these next couple picks, which I like. You're looking for a little bit more high upside. They take Asim Richards out of UNC at the end of the fifth round. Totally fine value for me. as He's a really light college tackle, but a fantastic athlete. I thought he moved well, but just not a very sticky blocker. Needs to really get to work in the weight room, but there is starter upside in Richards, so he's kind of a draft and stash developmental lineman. Eric Scott out of Southern Miss. I did not watch, um, you know, only have time to get around to so many players. I did 343 this year uh, as far as tape evals, but uh, Eric Scott ran a 471 at cornerback, which was a big turnoff for me. It could be he's faster than that and something happened there with that workout, or they could view him as a safety. But uh, in the sixth round, I'm fine with it. He's got good size. So if they see, see, something they're, uh, see something they like, we'll see. This is a team that has converted corners to safety in the past uh, very frequently, honestly. Um, then you've got Deuce Vaughn at the end of the sixth round. How can you not love this pick? And Deuce Vaughn's dad even got to call him from Dallas because he's a minority owner. So that's just super like this pick just screams fun, but it also has a chance to really return value here. So the beauty of this pick is it's, you know, so the, the risk is so worth the reward because he's he's an athletic player and he doesn't have to be coached hardly anything at the running back position. He is productive. He understands the position. He's good in the receiving game. You're going to know pretty much right away if a 5'5", five 175-pound five, running back can actually play in the NFL. And if that size outlier is too much and he can't really make guys miss like he did at Kansas State, he can't run away from guys like he did at Kansas State, it's fine. You spent basically a seventh-round pick on him. But if his skill set does translate, you very well could be getting something like the next Darren Sproles to come out of Kansas State. So... I just think it's such a fun pick. It's such a why not pick at this point. Dallas needs some running back depth, uh, someone to to maybe you know spell Tony Pollard on third downs occasionally because he's going to be getting a lot more workload with Zeke gone. So I think it's a great pick and very boomer bust with his size, but uh, I think it's very much worth it at that point. Uh, and then they take Jalen Brooks out of South Carolina. Another player I actually did not get around to. I did 54 wide receivers, and he was not one of them that I watched. So we'll see what he can do. But, you know, I think it's still a good draft for Dallas. I just really cannot stand by and support the day two picks for them. I think they were both massive reaches. I don't see either of them having much of an impact on the team. And, again, I could be completely wrong about that. I hope I am. But I'm going to bet against those two picks. But I am absolutely betting on Mazzy Smith as an incredible pick. Just getting him and Velami Fahoko, like that D line got even better when they were already one of the best in the league. And they got it like the two spots that they could have found roles for guys. So I, I do love that aspect of the draft. Uh, so we're going to go a C plus for the Dallas Cowboys, being fairly critical of those day two picks. 
This show is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy, the easiest place to play fantasy football. The moment this draft is complete, Best Ball Mania 4 goes live, and it is the biggest fantasy football competition of all time. Not even kidding. It's only 25 bucks to enter for your shot at $15 million in total prizes and a first place prize of $3 million. You won't want to miss out on this action. The best part is, because it's best ball format, all you have to do is draft your teams, which you can do at home on your phone thanks to the amazing Underdog app. In Best Ball Mania, you join the tournament, draft your team as you would in any normal fantasy football league, and your lineup is locked in once the draft is complete. No waivers, no trades. That's right. It is set it and forget it until it's time to collect your cash. Underdog automatically optimizes your lineup weekly to create the highest scoring option. What are you waiting for? Get signed up at underdogfantasy.com or via the App Store with promo code TFG and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's Underdog Fantasy promo code TFG for your shot at $15 million inside Best Ball Mania 4. But let's move on to the New York Giants. To me, I'm not sure there's a team that had a better first and second round draft pick in the New York uh, than the New York Giants did. They get to meet Deontay Banks, who was a surefire top 10 player in this draft class to me. There were teams that I could not believe passed on him. He is such a fun watch. He's an incredible athlete. He can go, he can go press man coverage. He's six feet, 200 pounds. He's got great physicality at the line of scrimmage. He's got the speed and quickness and reactionary quickness to run with guys man to man down the field. But what even stood out more about Deontay Banks was how good he was in zone coverage, where I'm not sure he got enough credit there. I loved Deontay Banks. He's been a my guy throughout this process. I thought he was a surefire top 20 pick. He's a huge need for the Giants. Everyone was screaming wide receiver for the Giants, but corner was actually a much bigger need right now than, than wide receiver. So for me to get him at 24 is an S certified steal in the first round. And then you get the guy that's been my Mazzy Smith for the New York Giants, the guy that I'm always taking in the first round. So that was kind of a ring the bell moment for me is tying these two guys together with Buffalo, who I think if you know they make the trade up to get Deontay Banks, I can only imagine that they're just like me. And if Banks wasn't there and they didn't feel like they had to move up for him, they would have been just totally fine sitting put and taking John Michael Schmitz in the first round. So to get him at 226, this is so eerily familiar to when the Kansas City Chiefs got Creed Humphrey in the second round. And when I watched John Michael Schmitz, I felt like I was watching Creed Humphrey at Oklahoma. And that's why I liked him so much. Now, he's not as big. He didn't test quite as well as Creed. And I don't know if he's going to be a you know first-team All-Pro kind of guy. And that's why I didn't go all the way with that comp. But I think it's there's a lot of parallels there. I think John Michael Schmitz should have gone a lot earlier. He is a day-one starter, a massive upgrade to this offensive line. And there you go, Giants. You get to eat your you get your cake and you get to eat it too, because you still get good value at wide receiver in the third round, getting Jalen Hyatt. And I always thought top 50 hype, especially first round hype on Jalen Hyatt, was asinine. You know, I think he's a potentially good vertical threat at the next level. I'm terrified of the frame. I'm terrified that he didn't face press coverage. Uh, at the college level, the scheme he came from was was perfect for this for for uh, Jalen Hyatt to produce and just run fast. But he does have good ball tracking ability, and he's faster than the four four forty that he ran at the combine. I'm not sure why he wasn't able to really uh, unlock that speed on the track, but um, he's got football speed, and that much very much shows. He's going to be in a good situation here, where. You know, if the concern was, well, he got schemed up at Tennessee, it's not going to be that way at the NFL level. I'm not sure there's a play caller in the NFL that is better at scheming up individual play playmakers for their own skill set. We saw that last year with Darius Slayton here in this very offense. Brian Dable's going to find creative ways to motion Jalen Hyatt. He might even do what they did at Tennessee and cover him up with an Isaiah Hodgins in front of him so that he doesn't get pressed. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Brian Dable is creative enough to do that kind of stuff. Now, I don't know if he's going to be a better player immediately than um, Darius Slayton, 
they brought Darius Slayton back on a one-year deal, and I think Jalen Hyatt is in a spot where he doesn't have to produce right away. You know, my comp for him is Quez Watkins. I think this is this is good value where they got him. I don't think this is some incredible steal or anything. This is about the range where I had him, late second, early third round, and, and I think it's a really good pick and a potential starter down the road for them. So I, I really couldn't be any higher, honestly, on what they did in the first two days of the draft. And then day two, I think, was pretty solid. There was nothing I really have any uh, major criticisms about. You take Eric Gray out of Oklahoma. You know, I think it was, it was a fine pick. He's a, he's a balanced back that whenever Saquon needs to come off the field, you can kind of slide Eric Gray in. He can run with a little bit of power. He's got vision. He's smooth in the receiving game. Very much a just a guy at the running back position. But he's kind of, like I said, he's just liquid mer- mercury for that RB2 spot. And he can do a little bit of everything for you. I think it's a fine pick. Um, they take Trey Hawkins out of Old Dominion. I, I didn't get to his tape, but he is a remarkable athlete, a gamble on athleticism at the end of the sixth round. I think that's a solid pick. Jordan Riley, a, a nose tackle out of Oregon that they saw something in. I didn't get to his tape either. Uh, but then they take Gervarius Owens out of Houston, who really looks the part. He has a great highlight reel. Um which drew my interest, but then I watched his tape and I was like, oh God, there's a lot to work on here. Very much a raw safety, but he looks the part. He's got speed. He's got length. Uh, He looks like a starting free safety in the NFL. He's filled out and long. He's fluid. So there's something there. He obviously doesn't have to start right away. Uh, Get him covering kicks and and see if Wink Martindale can coach this guy up. Um, But overall, I love this New York Giants draft. I think they nailed value all the way down the board, uh, especially in the first three rounds, which is where it really matters. I'm going to give this an A-plus grade. There's really nothing I, I would notably change about this draft. Love this draft for the New York Giants who uh, we're, we're working together, Giants fans. You have, like, all of my favorite players, and just because I didn't think you were a true 6-0 team last year, whatever it was, I do like the Giants, and I think they're building something really special with that staff, and now the roster talent is catching up. So the, the NFC East is really getting stacked at this point, especially as we get to this Philadelphia Eagles draft, which was, honestly, this, this draft... Instead of showing you the graphic, I should just show you the Breaking Bad meme of the, he can't keep getting away with it. Because Howie Roseman is running laps around the NFL, complete circles. This draft is absurd what he pulled off. So Jalen Carter with the ninth overall pick. Now, there's obvious reasons why this is an incredible pick. And I was raving about this on draft day. But if if I'm going to keep things consistent here... I can't sit here in February and March and acknowledge the off-field concerns being a very real thing. He actually falls to number nine. NFL teams like Detroit and these guys were passing on him. The Raiders passing on him. There are very legitimate off-field concerns here. I don't think this is a certified steal. I had him as a top 10 player. He goes ninth, right? It's great value for sure. It's where he should have gone. But Just because he landed with a bunch of Georgia teams on a winning team doesn't mean he's going to mature. And I do think there are maturity issues with him. He, And it's not just the maturity. The biggest thing for me is as great as he is, as talented as he is, he's not going to come in and be Aaron Donald right away. He's not going to come in and be Jeffrey Simmons right away, Quinn and Williams right away. You know, you still have to get better at the next level. And... Is that going to be something that he doesn't put in the time in the film room, doesn't really listen to coaches because he's so full of himself? I think there are legitimate questions about that type of stuff, but it's still an A pick, right? This is a a terrifying concept of if you get the the boom side of things with Jalen Carter on this D-line, with the leadership structure around him, you are talking about a generally generationally great interior defensive line tandem. You're bringing all these guys back together. It was the best defensive line in college football history. Basically, everybody but Trayvon Walker, who is the worst out of this group, he just happened to get drafted the highest. Um, you know, this is this is pretty damn crazy that uh, that that he that he he he, he um, is filling in to this group. And then they take Nolan Smith at the end of the first round. And this is stealing value. I thought Nolan Smith was a certified top 20 pick. My freaking pro comp for him is Hassan Reddick. 
And this is a classic Eagles pick. D-line, not drafting for need, just let's fill this thing. Like, we are never going to run out of the pipeline when it comes to line play. That is what they value. You knew it was going to be O-line, D-line heavy in the first couple of rounds, as it always is. So, you know, Nolan Smith is honestly probably not going to play a ton. Like, early on, you have... His pro comp in Hassan Reddick there. You have Josh Sweat. You have Brandon Graham coming back. Even Milton Williams is going to kind of, you know, play a little bit of five tech and stuff. So, like, he's just going to kind of be hanging out, being a leader, making an impact when he can. And, and he's probably going to be really efficient when he's out there. But someday, Nolan Smith is going to probably become Hassan Reddick. Like, I feel pretty damn confident with the very team that made Hassan Reddick have the best year of his career, turn him into a top 10 pass rusher. You're probably getting that in Nolan Smith here, who's like a physical clone of the guy. So they didn't have a second round pick, um, but they did end up moving down, I think, into the top of the third. And that's where they take Tyler Steen. So I I liked Steen's tape a lot, and I kind of reluctantly give this a B. Like, this is the lowest graded pick that they made, but I still think it's a really good pick. I just, I have the criteria in the description below, and I want to keep things consistent. But when I really think about it, like, I could have easily given this an A, because if I had graded Tyler Steen as a true guard, which I think they are going to um, play him at, looking back on it, I probably would have a thir- have had a third round grade on Tyler Steen. He's a really powerful player, a nasty run blocker, a guy that's, you know, a high recruiting profile that started at Alabama. You know, he's he, he could be a really good guard, a potentially high-end starting guard for them. So I'm not going to retroactively, like, change my grade. But if I'm being honest, like, I probably would have had him as more of a third-round guy. So I can totally get behind that. You know, at tackle, he had some footwork stuff and some hand usage stuff, and he's got kind of a weird build at tackle. But if they see him as just a guard, I really like it. And maybe eventually he can slide back out to tackle if, if, um, if, if you lose Lane Johnson. So... Uh, very good pick. And then Sidney Brown right after that. Great value. They needed to get a safety at some point. To me, they got one of these guys in that tier two for me of potential day one starters. And uh, I'm excited to see what Sidney Brown can do in this system. I've gone on and 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 on. For those that have been around the channel, like it is a it is a a freaking automatic button at this point, talking about players that played slot corner flipping out to being a quarters-heavy hybrid safety in a Fangio-style defense, and that being a very smooth transition. That very much applies to Sidney Brown, a guy that played a lot of linebacker, a lot of slot corner at Illinois, was really good in that spot, um, has the speed to play on the back end, just didn't do it a ton. So it is a projection with his skill set, but there are a lot of comparisons to what Sidney Brown was at, El- at Illinois to what Chauncey Gardner-Johnson was at Florida. The one thing with Sidney Brown is he's one of the worst tackling defensive players I've ever seen. He's got um, you know, kind of a smaller frame. He doesn't break down at the tackle point. He's got highlight tackles, but that's not the same as being a consistent tackler. This guy missed, what, what, did, I, what did I have on it, 80? Let me get this number right. Three hours later. 70 missed tackles in his career at Illinois, averaging around 17% missed tackle rate. You know, Brian Branch missed zero in 2021 for perspective there. So uh, that's something they're going to have to really clean up or you're losing the definition of being a safety on the back end. If you're coming downhill and whiffing one out of five times, that can be a problem for your defense. It really can. So I do want to see him clean that up. want to see that skill set translate to safety. But the athleticism, the, the playmaking stuff, it's it's very much there on the back end. So uh, could end up being a Chauncey Gardner replacement immediately for them. And then you get to day three, and guess what? They just keep stealing value. They steal Keely Ringo. They trade up to get him at the top of the fourth round. You know, I wasn't the biggest Keely Ringo guy as a first-round pick, and a lot of people were confused why he was only my 10th corner in the draft. But for me, like... That type of size, speed, profile, it's its almost like Tariq Woolen falling last year. That can play in the right spot in, in the NFL. And I think Keel Ringo now falling into the fourth round is, is great for him because he's going to have to earn playing time. But also, it makes it much more reasonable to convince him to move to safety if that's going to be his best path to playing. And I think Keely Ringo has incredible upside as a safety if, if he's willing to buy in to that position change. 
and that's just kind of tough to project. But, I mean, seriously, Ringo and Brown could be a really nasty safety duo on the back end. Ringo's a physical player. He likes to tackle. I could see him with that speed being a very good safety on the back end. So you you are just stealing an exceptional, rare athlete that did belong on day two at some point. Um, you know, I, I couldn't believe he kept getting passed on in the third round. So to get him in the fourth, that's a certified steal, in my opinion. He's a boomer bust player. There's a there's bust potential there, absolutely, and, and he might never play because he's just not a good cover player when you watch his tape. Um, but he's young and and obviously like the tools are there. Uh, and then Tanner McKee in the sixth round, like this is what the Eagles do, right? They invest in the quarterback position time and time again. They find weird opportunities for these guys to make it, you know, whether it's Jalen Hurts or Kevin Cobb or Nick Foles, like. To get Tanner McKee in the sixth round where he's going to come in as a third quarterback, he's going to get to learn the offense and just kind of hang out for a year with Marcus Mariota there. And then into year two and year three, this is the kind of player that if you can just get him, if, if for some reason he has to start a game, if Jalen Hurts hurts his ankle or something and he misses a week in like 2024, 2025, we know Tanner McKee is a young player. He's got like really good, like he's got a really strong arm. He's a better athlete than he gets credit for. He's, he's not a runner, but he can move a little bit. Let's say he comes in in some random week 12 game in 2024 and he balls out. Like you could, this is the kind of player you could flip for a second or a third round pick if someone kind of liked him and you get to see him now having developed and you are going to have a great team around him to play well in that opportunity. Like I think. The value is just so incredibly high at this point for a quarterback with upside in Tanner McKee. And then just because he felt like it, he stole Moro Ojamo at the very end of the draft. I, I think Moro Ojamo is a very good role player for the NFL level. Like he is, he's an excellent run defender. He has excellent technique and just kind of like good core strength relative to his size as a three technique, someone that probably won't play much in his rookie year. But once Fletcher Cox is gone and maybe um, uh, uh, Tui, yeah, they have a Tui Polo too of their own, but uh, maybe he leaves in free agency in a year or two, and you have another guy that can plug in as an early down run defending three technique next to Jordan Davis there. Uh, I think it's just good value. He's a good football player. Maybe he develops as a pass rusher, too. He's got good raw athleticism. He just hasn't put it all together on the field. So I don't know how you can really give Philly anything other than an A+. The only like minor nitpick was that Tyler Steen, if viewed as a tackle, was about a round earlier than I would have taken him. But like I said, if I could retroactively change my grade on him, which I'm not going to do because I, I just want to be consistent here, if I could re retroactively change my grade on him, I think I'd have a third-round grade on him as a guard. So uh, I just – Howie Roseman is – he is Tier 1. He is the best GM in the NFL. He is having a historic run, and the Eagles have set themselves up to be right back in position uh, playing in the last game of the season again this year. So um, fantastic job, Howie Roseman. Then we got the Washington Commanders, who had a, an interesting draft, you know, right, right away in the first round. They take Emmanuel Forbes at 16. was a very surprising pick for myself and, and certainly a lot of people. You know, I've been very much pounding the table for this idea that Emmanuel Forbes has to. Like, watch my cornerback rankings. When I ranked him sixth, I was like saying, I cannot stress this enough. He has to go to a Fangio style system, meaning a team that runs a lot of off coverage from their cornerbacks, a lot of quarters coverage where they're reading the quarterback's eyes, they're playing in space and not necessarily having to play a lot of press coverage, get up in receivers faces, hang tight man to man down the field where the corners are essentially an extension of the safety staff. And I tweeted this out. This is all on record. You can check my cornerbacks rankings where I talked about this. I tweeted it out, a list here of nine teams running that Fangio system and Washington being one of those nine teams. And, and this tweet was all about how, you know, teams that run this system are going to have a first round grade on Emmanuel Forbes. If you want to run press man coverage, you probably have a fourth to a fifth round grade on him. So he's an he is probably the most scheme dependent player 
that I may have ever evaluated, especially as a first-round player. So it's a very unique conversation around Emmanuel Forbes when you're talking about a guy that I had a second-round grade on, but I'm grading independent of scheme, right? And I was like, I don't know what the hell to do with that. I said, you know, first-round grade for a team like Washington, fifth-round grade for a team like the Minnesota Vikings because he's lanky. Uh, he's 166 pounds at six foot one. He's not going to be getting up in guys' face in press man coverage if he's trying to bang with wide receivers down the field, subtle push-offs. It, you know, he's going to let guys accelerate through him. There's no play strength to Emmanuel Forbes' game. He's like a ghost out there, right? He can stay with guys, but he can't really disrupt the receiver's routes throughout the play. But the beauty is once the ball's in the air, he can go from ethereal to corporeal and reemerge out of thin air almost almost, and, and break on balls with this rapid quickness. So as long as he's allowed to play in space and navigate in and around the receivers from zone coverage, he has remarkable traits. He's not just athletic. Like, he has a crazy first step, but he's long. He's got reach. So he's kind of like Darius Williams for the Jags in this kind of off-coverage system, what DJ Reed was for the Seahawks, where he's really quick, but he's long, unlike those corners where they're five foot nine. Um, but on top of that, he's got great IQ, great playmaking instincts. He's got 30 interceptions in his last six years of football going back to high school. So I actually, even though like a lot of people are going to view it as a reach, and even based on like my own board and all this stuff, like, yeah, I probably would have taken Deontay Banks or Christian Gonzalez first. And I, I will throw that out there, but I'm not going to be the least bit surprised if Emmanuel Forbes is fantastic in this system. I think you also do have to note that he is so system dependent. You know, I think Banks and Gonzalez are going to be less system dependent players. If Ron Rivera does get fired this year, what if they bring in, what if Brian Flores balls out? as the Vikings defensive coordinator and the commanders want to hire him. Brian Flores isn't going to want anything to do with Emmanuel Forbes. So I, I do think you have to think about that a little bit, but overall, as long as everything goes well here, I think they're going to be just fine with the value that they're getting from Emmanuel Forbes. So I'm actually going to defend that pick, even though I can imagine a lot of people won't. Um, but I'm excited to see him in this system because all along, this is the type of defense he had to play in. Um, and then in the second uh, the second round, they take another one of my my guys, Jatavius Martin out of Illinois. Really happy to see him go in the second round. I loved his tape. This is this is where he belonged. Uh, was a really good riser throughout this process. And hey, have you ever heard that converted slot corners make really good cover four hybrid safeties? I wonder where you may have heard that before. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the same deal here. Jatavius Martin kind of in in the same breath of all of those players that have made that that transition from slot corner in the past. But Jatavis Martin has also played a lot of free safety as well. He played everywhere for Illinois. This guy's a complete freak. 44640, unbelievable vertical jump of 44 inches, 133 inch broad jump. He's got good ball skills, great tackler. I think he's got a good chance and and look, I like Cameron Curl. I like um uh, Derek Forrest as well was a my guy several years ago who who he's hit. Uh, talk about a, a you know a day three draft grade that I was pounding the table for a guy and it actually worked out. Um, you know I like those guys, but I think Jatavius Martin has a higher upside and um, you know maybe he can play slot corner right away because that that cornerback room is just very thin at the moment. But whether wherever he's playing, he's going to be a playmaker for them. And I think long term his best fit is going to be as one of those starting safeties. Maybe they don't want to pay Cameron Curl. Uh, after this year and they see a little bit more upside with the speed that a guy like Martin has that a guy like Curl does not and then you'd have a super athletic duo uh, Derek Forrest by the way played a ton of slot corner at Cincinnati so just another example but you'd have a really athletic duo between Martin and Forrest uh, Ricky Stromberg at the end of the third round a, like a little bit early for me if I'm going to be honest but I think he's a good player reminds me a lot of when the Jags took Luke Fortner last year I thought he was, you know, a guy that nothing really wrong with his game. His technique is good. He's tough, but just very physically limited. Not the biggest guy, not the strongest guy, certainly not the most athletic guy. I think best, not best case, but like most likely outcome, he's a, a good backup center and guard. If you get that at the end of the third round, I'm not going to knock you for it. Um, but it was just a, a touch early. I'd be a little bit surprised if he turned into like a good starter for them, but I could very well be wrong. Uh, then you get to day three. And you take uh, an athlete 
at offensive line in Braden Dad- Daniels. So I like getting like a higher floor guy who, if you do need someone to start, he's going to be able to go out there in Stromberg and, and not get lost. And then you take Braden Daniels, who I like that they announced him as a guard because at tackle, he's just not strong enough. I still think he's not strong enough to play guard, but if he can put on some you know functional muscle, he's a really good athlete, he's a good run blocker, I think that was a solid pick. K.J. Henry makes a lot of sense here. I I know they didn't pick up Chase Young's uh, contract, but I still think they believe in their heart of hearts that he's going to work out, and and hopefully he does, and you don't need a a starter on the edge. K.J. Henry is like an ideal third edge guy. He's really quick. He's um, just smaller, though, and limited as, as far as his upside is concerned. But he was productive at Clemson. He's got a vast variety of quick hitting uh, pass rush moves, swim moves, uh, outside inside counters. He gives it his best against the run, but he's limited there. They need some depth on the edge, and I think they found it in KJ Henry. Uh, and then Chris Rodriguez, I thought this was really good value. I had a true fifth round grade on him. They take him in the middle of the sixth. It's funny, I, I got to his eval earlier this week, and I was like, oh, that's Brian Robinson, <laughs> who I think I had maybe a fourth or a fifth round grade on last year. Um, very similar player. Looks the part, like full-size running back. A little bit different stylistically where he's really light on his feet, Chris Rodriguez. He's got a slender lower half, which doesn't always work well for running backs. And I don't think Rodriguez has a great contact balance style about him. Like, if guys go low on him, he's going to probably go down. Um, You know, it's not like he's Kareem Hunt or some of these guys that have that low center of gravity, he's a different style. He's actually going to someone, he's someone that's going to have a lot of his weight in his upper half, and he's going to just lower his shoulder and run those light feet through the tackle. So like he's, he's someone that invites contact. He consistently fights for difficult yardage. He had to do that at Kentucky because their offensive line, which is well documented with all the Will Levis coverage was fucking terrible last year. So I, I think if something happens to, Brian Robinson, you have a, a really kind of plug and play player there, and Chris Rodriguez, and uh, hard to argue with that value in the sixth round. Uh, and then they take Andre Jones. Uh, I did not have a draftable grade on him. Granted, he had a hamstring issue that he had to pull up on his 40 yard dash. If he was able to clock a good time, that probably would have been enough to get him draftable, but. Uh, not a very high play strength player. The athletic profile a little bit in question, honestly. Like for a guy that wasn't productive, isn't very polished, not the best run defender. I prefer to have guys that were able to do their workouts and show you on paper that he's got really good traits. Now, uh, maybe they have GPS testing or they just really trust their eye at that. That's fine, but um, and it's you know seventh round pick, whatever. I'm just gonna be honest. I I didn't see it, but. It's not even going to change their draft grade. It's just worth noting that I, I didn't see anything there in him. So overall, I'm going to give the, give Washington a B plus. I think this secondary is going to be dope. And then they got a backup running back. And they had a pretty good draft. Like They definitely could have done a little bit more with some of those picks. But that's being nitpicky. A B plus is a good grade. And I think this is a, it's going to be a really fun defense next year. That's That's for damn sure. All right, there are your draft grades for the NFC East. We are now going to head to the AFC and do the North and East um, divisions there next. Thank you so much for watching. Please do hit that like button if you enjoyed. Drop your comments down below where you agree, where you disagree. Uh, Also, I invite you to um, bring up any undrafted free agents that these teams signed. And if I see your comment, I'll try and uh, respond to if uh, I have any thoughts on those. But thank you so much for watching. And we'll see you soon for the next Draft Grades video. Peace out.